let me just uh, welcome everybody myself and I'll say a few words about myself. I'm a woodblock print artist and guitarist, uh, a retired, but one among other jobs. I was a hospital worker and an AFSME local union officer for about nine terms. Um, I'm a about 50 year member of the CPUSA, next year actually it'll be 50 years, and a member of the National Committee and National Board. And I'm the author of the forthcoming book, Green Strategy from International Publishers, which I hope will be out within the next couple of months. Um, we're gonna look today at the Marxist theory of the state, what that means, what some of the complexities are. Um, so let me get right to it. My goals are to discuss those complexities, to highlight the importance of estimating the balance of forces in anything, any political issues that we look at, to argue for our party's position on the possibility of a peaceful path to socialism, and to clarify what our view of the state and the struggle for state power means for issues such as electoral struggles, armed struggle, the sources of violence and revolutions, and similar subjects. However, I am a Marxist, but I'm not a Marxist scholar, so I did not do original research for this. I relied on others who were scholars to do that for me. So some of my quotes are from secondary sources. Um, I also want to say there are important issues related to the question of the nature of the state and how it has changed and grown, which I have not attempted to cover not because they aren't important, but because I can't cover everything in one presentation. Uh, for example, I'm not gonna try and delve deeply into issues of the deep state or the surveillance state, the ways in which technology is transforming many of the functions of government, issues related to gun control or more broadly about the US Constitution, issues about the nature of a developed socialist state or anything to do with the nature of pre-capitalist state formations. So I apologize in advance that we won't get to all important issues today. Uh, however, that's not my fault. I asked Dee for 10 hours, but she just wouldn't give it to me. So we're trying to get through all of this in two hours. There will be uh, a couple of points for discussion during the presentation and hopefully I will uh, get through it in enough time that there's uh, time for discussion at the end, and D will be moderating that. So I want to start with the balance of forces. Uh, this might seem like an odd way to start, but I want to pose a rhetorical question. Has resident Trump committed impeachable offenses? I would assume that most people who are uh, participating would say, most definitely he's committed a whole number. So if so, why has he not yet been impeached? There's a variety of reasons. One is because the voting population is very nearly evenly split. Um, there's all kinds of reasons for that and uh, qualifiers to that, but still the, the, the vote totals are way too close, even though uh, Hillary Clinton got more votes than Donald Trump in the last election, there were still tens and tens of millions of people who voted for Trump. So it's not a, the voting population is not as lopsided as you would think it should be. Another reason is that the non-voting section of the populace, which is uh, massive, does has no voting power to make elected politicians pay for their attitude to Trump or for their kissing his boots or refusing to uh, challenge him on anything. Uh, another reason is that Republican control controls both houses of Congress now, and as, a, as a, that's a result of a whole number of factors. Gerrymandering, voter suppression, racism and misogyny, demagogy, destroying campaign finance laws and others. Another reason is that there's not enough pressure yet on elected Republicans to split from Trump, and too much of the Republican base will punish elected Republicans in primaries if they do split from Trump. Another reason is that not all elected Democrats are willing to go there, at least not yet. Some of them maybe because they're not convinced, some of them because there's not enough pressure on them, some of them because they want to wait for the cover of the 
results of the Mueller investigation before they come out and say anything definite. There's all kinds of reasons, but they all come down to not enough public pressure on all elected officials uh, to take a more forthright stand. And a minor one is that Pence's impeachment insurance. Same thing we used to say about Dan Quayle. My point is, in other words, there is not yet a favorable balance of political forces in our country to compel impeachment. It's about political power and organization, not about whether impeachment is right or wrong or whether it ought to happen. So it's all about the balance of forces. Um, to understand the tactical problems, we must do what Lenin once called the core of Marxism and Marxist tactics, calculate the balance of forces. And this is as true of our view of the state and how to transform it as of anything else. So, for example, Fidel, when he visited uh, Allende's Chile, kept this correlation of forces in mind. He said, quote, I am not an unconditional devotee of bourgeois legality, and I have said that parliament is an anachronistic institution, but nobody suppresses it until he is able to suppress it. And he was speaking in part to those on the left who thought that Allende should have done more than he was possibly able to do, that you have to have a favorable balance of forces to actually accomplish your goals. So that what I'm getting at is that questions of the state and state power, peaceful or violent revolution, the balance of power, the balance of forces are not abstract issues. They're not static. They don't stay in one place. They depend on the realities of the struggle at a given moment. And these questions of the state in particular are not articles of faith or dogmas or mantras that we should repeat. Uh, but to answer those questions requires that we wrestle with real tough, difficult, and changeable politics. So that what was true 10 years ago or five years ago or five years from now will be very different than our reality at this moment. I also want to note that, in my opinion, there is no abstract hierarchy of better revolutionary tactics. And this very much applies to a Marxist approach to the state. Some approach strategy as if organizing workers is OK, mass demonstrations are better, civil disobedience is even better, and best of all is armed struggle. They talk as if armed struggle and only armed struggle is the real revolutionary path under any and all conditions. They act as if the only choice is that we slowly work our way up through this hierarchy until we get to the real struggle. However, our approach, our understanding of Marxism and the Communist Party and many others is that real revolutionary approaches to issues are to match our tactics to our actual circumstances, not what we wish was the case, but what is actually the case and what it will actually take to change the balance of forces. Uh, and this is a quote from Boerstein, Edward Boerstein, Allende's Chile, uh, which I quoted extensively in the readings and which I highly recommend as a primer about the importance of strategy. And he said, true revolutionary consciousness is not a matter of presenting absolute demands without regard to whether the time is right for them or not. It requires an understanding of the problems of the revolution and a sense of discipline and sometimes patience, and sometimes impatience. So when we approach questions of the state, we, we run into often conflicting Marxist quotes, and I'm going to give you some examples. Marx and Engels in the manifesto point to the violent upheaval that accompanied prior fundamental shifts in society, but some people take that as prescriptive, meaning that's the only way they can happen, and others read it as descriptive. That's the way it most often has happened in the past. Uh, both, but both Marx and Engels later in life saw some potential for a peaceful transition in some democratic countries. Lenin argued uh, during the prior, you know, the decade or more prior to the Russian Revolution, uh, he argued both for participating and in other cases against participating in the um, 
the Duma, the bourgeois parliament in Russia, which was uh, fairly powerless and a sort of a, a sop to those who uh, were not yet ready for the overthrow of the czar. So he argued in uh, differently depending on the different circumstances. He also saw for a brief period earlier in 1917, the possibility of a peaceful working class led revolution in Russia. And then the circumstances changed and he changed his opinion of what the moment called for. So a couple of quotes from Lenin. I won't read the whole thing. Uh, he said, the liberation of the oppressed class is impossible, not only without a violent revolution, but also without the destruction of the apparatus of state power. In another place, he said, the proletariat will be unable to prepare for victory over the bourgeoisie unless it wages a many-sided, consistent, and revolutionary struggle for democracy, which some would argue is the opposite of violent revolution. Uh, I think that's a debatable point, but there's apparent differences between his things he said at different times. He said, the bourgeois state cannot be superseded by the proletarian state, though through the process of withering, withering away, but as a general rule, only through a violent revolution. Um, and I make a little note there, just a question to think about. So what are we to make of these differences, these different emphasis, actually almost opposite claims at different times? First, we have to go back to the balance of forces issue. It depends upon the circumstances. We enter into a revolutionary movement in circumstances beyond our control. We don't decide what the political uh, landscape is. Uh, we don't decide based on some quotes from 100 or 150 years ago, what the right tactics are, we have to look at our real circumstances. And the actual process of revolution depends on the relative strength and unity of the contending classes. So often, some of the revolutions that have happened in Russia and some other countries that were primarily peasant countries, um, they were able to succeed because of the relative uh, weakness and disunity of the capitalist class, uh, which was not yet fully in control. There were still elements of feudalism and uh, the peasant economy was still where the masses of people were and the capitalist class was relatively weak and small and that was a key factor in the ability of those revolutions to succeed. Certainly not the only one, but one factor. It depends on the level of socialist consciousness and commitment, not by a revolutionary party alone, but by large sections of the populace. And it depends upon the level of organization. Uh, I just want to note that there's a problem with arguing from quotes. They're almost by definition taken out of context. They don't tell, tell us automatically what was happening politically at the time or who the writer was arguing with and what they were arguing about. Uh, and I apologize, I know I'm using quotes too, so sue me. So what is this Marxist theory of the state? Here's a fairly long quote from Engels. The state is the admission that society has become entangled in an insoluble contradiction with itself, that it is cleft into irreconcilable antagonisms which it is powerless to dispel. In other words, the state is, or society is, a, um, a unity of opposites which struggle with each other. And society, capitalist society, for example, is unable to resolve those contradictions. It can postpone them, it can lessen them, it can increase them, but it cannot resolve them. That when these insoluble, antagonisms uh, come to the fore, a power apparently standing above society becomes necessary. For the purpose of moderating the conflict, keeping it within the bounds of order, and this power arising out of society but so artificially placing itself above it and increasingly alienating itself from it is the state. 
or Lenin said, the state is a product and manifestation of the irreconcilability of class antagonisms, an organ of class rule, an organ for the oppression of one class by another. A standing army and police are the chief instruments of state power. But we have to ask, is the state just coercive? Sometimes when we talk about the state, it seems as if we're only talking about the coercive, repressive functions of government, the police forces, the intelligence forces, the uh, prison system, um, and the legal system that uh, enables those things. But so other times we seem to be talking about uh, everything that has to do with the government. So while the armed forces and police, in my opinion, are the chief coercive instruments of state power and class rule, alongside the virtually dictatorial power of employers in hiring and in the workplace, they do not constitute the entirety of the state. The state, in my opinion, and I think most Marxists, is a series of institutions, legislative, judicial, repressive, and intelligence gathering, set up to guarantee and enforce the status quo, to ameliorate conflicts within the ruling class, to ensure the continuation of money and power for the capitalist class. The state especially is the coercive organs of state power, as which I just described, which are authorized to use state-sanctioned violence to enforce the laws of private property, inheritance, employer prerogatives, and limits on the ability of masses of people to demonstrate, protest, and affect change. But the state includes not just institutions, but also the system of laws and accepted practices which serve the ruling class. But I don't want to oversimplify things too much. Uh, here's a series of questions, and uh, they may you may think them easy to answer or obvious, but I'll ask them anyway. Is your local school board or library board part of the state? Are all elected representative bodies at every level part of the state? Even if all local government institutions are not part of the coercive apparatus of the state, Local police forces, for example, are charged with enforcing private property rights enshrined in our legal system. So are local police part of the course of apparatus or is our local city council? Uh, this is the question. And we also should ask, are all national governmental institutions and agencies part of what we think of as the state, even if they aren't particularly coercive or coercive in the term, or they are coercive, but coercive in the terms of we have one limits on the ability of the capitalist class to do certain things. For example, pollute our atmosphere or um, a variety of other things. So is the FDA, when it distributes food stamps, part of the state? Is our state labor and industries agencies part of the state when they force employers to obey the law? This comes down to, is the state synonymous with government and with government at every level? So I, we have a few minutes for people to wrestle with this question. What do you think? And uh, I'm asking Dee to help moderate these brief discussions. We'll take about five minutes if people want to talk about it. Okay, the floor will be open for discussion. If you would like to speak, please use uh, your, uh, just click your the hand, click the picture of the hand, click the raised hand icon, and I'll be able to uh, open your mic. Just a second, please. Just a second, please. Emil, your mic is open. Hello, Mark, and thank you very much for this and all the other things that you've done in this format. Uh, I take one issue with you, with your, your statement that you're not a Marxist theorist. I beg <laughs> to differ on that, and I'd love to see some of this in writing. Uh, I Maybe you're going to discuss this further, but what about the idea that in certain state institutions, for instance, uh, universities, state universities where I have taught, uh, they are 
state institutions in all the senses that Marx, Engels, and Lenin said, but they're also fields of, of uh, contention, uh, of working class interests uh, versus the, the capitalist interests. That's all. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Just a moment. Just a moment. Irving, your mic is open. You have to click. Hi, this is Irving from Philadelphia. Um, the thing that I had, I think it, the FDA and the EPA are in fact part, are part of the state. Um, the thing that it happens is we sometimes confuse the direct action that we have to bring to bear on these institutions to kind of force them to do what they're supposed to do, that is protect the environment or provide um, the uh, appropriate amount of food stamps uh, because of administrative laws that uh, are open to interpretation. And if we just sit there and allow people to um, at their own whim, uh, enforce the law um, as opposed to pushing in the direction for the maximum amount of benefit to the working class, we end up shortchanged. So that, yes, it is a part of the state. There are repress, repressive regulations as well as positive regulations, but without the working class constantly pushing uh, the, the state um, along the progressive lines in its own interest, I, um, I, you, you, you have this uh, oppressive sort of, sort of situation or a thing that might go, uh, that will go in the interest only of the, uh, of the capitalist class. Okay. Maybe we'll take one more. That would be great. Lowell, your mic is open. Mark, this is riveting. I'm just, I'm so appreciative of the uh, the presentation so far. Um, to answer the question, um, is the state synonymous with the government? Absolutely. I'm I'm thinking back, and I can't reference the book, but it's um, Michel Foucault's writings on power, and how in these writings he takes the left, especially the task for focusing on sort of the bigger institutions that we usually talk about and completely ignoring libraries and school systems and public schools and the subtle ways that they reinforce the task of the nation state and being a course of system. For instance, schools, you know, historically, public schools historically training students to be factory workers and, and just the idea of learning to be there on time and sit in your desk quietly and the authorities in front of the class, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, I think all of these institutions need to be examined and they definitely are a part of the government. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I want to thank everybody for uh, leading exactly where I wanted to go, which is the point is that the state and the government taken as a whole contain contradictions. They are not, um, uh, uniform and uh, they, they do not play the same role in relation to uh, the, the, um, the needs of the ruling class. Some, of the, some institutions play a mediating role, some institutions play both a positive and negative role, some institutions are, are not really part of um, the power structure and don't become uh, part of a conflict until there is a broader conflict which they become a part of. I'll give you one example. I am confess that I am the chair of my local library board in the small town where I live. I don't think of my work there as being part of the state, uh, and it, it's not in the sense not particularly political. Uh, however, there were times during the McCarthy period where uh, people like me would have been kicked off of library boards or school boards. So the, the, the degree to which some of these bodies are part of the state and part of uh, reinforcing the dominant narrative and uh, dominant power 
uh, varies from one institution to another. We shouldn't treat them all as if they are one uh, undifferentiated whole. So the state includes the coercive apparatus of the government. It also includes the legal framework protecting property rights, uh, laws that contract law, which enables the capitalists to work out their differences. It laws limiting and restricting direct democracy, voting rights, rights to speak, assemble, and protest, laws criminalizing boycotts and civil disobedience. Those are part of the le legal framework around the course of apparatus of government, the justification, the rationalization, the codification of that power. And also part of the state are the legislative bodies charged with instituting, maintaining, and updating the legal framework. There are contradictions, however, as Emil pointed out. Uh, a Marxist approach to the state cannot be a static one-note view, a reductionist mantra such as the state is the executive committee of the ruling class. For example, Congress is responsible for laws and for passing and instituting and codifying the restrictive laws that are part of the state. Congress enables, supports, and finances the military, the intelligence apparatus, and it participates in imperialist foreign policy. Congress also helps maintain the illusion that we have a more complete democracy than we really have. However, Congress is also a forum for debate in which working class and poor people's interests can be fought for. And elections for Congress provide one avenue to fight for working class representation and working class needs and demands. And it is possible to elect people's champions, though this is often resisted by the system as we're seeing now in some of the internal struggles in the Democratic Party between uh, the rising of some Democratic socialists who are winning office and some reaction on the part of establishment Democrats to keep them from being, even being nominated um, representing the Democratic Party. So there's, there are contradictions, and those contradictions result in struggles. So Congress is part of the system of the state, but also congressional representatives can find ways to fight the state. Congress offers the illusion of full democracy, but also offers real, though limited, democratic participation. Congress and state legislatures pass laws restricting democracy, placing limits on workers' rights, but also Congress and state legislatures under public pressure can vote to finance programs that provide real benefits to workers and the poor. Congress votes for laws benefiting and protecting capitalism and the capitalist class, but also Congress and congressional electives, elections offer real avenues for struggle with the potential, though it, it is a slim potential at the current moment, of placing restrictions on capital and winning benefits for workers. So it is not one or the other, but both. Elective, electoral and legislative struggles contain these contradictions. So if we ignore the ways in which they function as part of the state, as legitimizing institutions, we end up intentionally or otherwise promoting illusions about bourgeois democracy. However, if we ignore the ways in which they offer opportunity for real people's victories, for organizing, people who are not yet ready for more radical action, if we ignore those real opportunities for democracy, we cede an entire field of battle to the enemy. And I think it would be a mistake, hence, to reduce all US political life to a state with which we should have nothing to do, or to reject all aspects of US democracy as only cover for the state. There are many ways in which our democracy is limited and in which some actors are trying very hard to restrict it even more, but there are also opportunities for real democratic input which need to be taken advantage of. It would be a mistake to reject working with tens of millions of workers and poor people who still see the electoral system as a way to work for justice as the only realistic alternative. Those are people we want to work with and win and ally ourselves with. It would be a mistake to reject working with any and all bourgeois politicians since they support the system. This would 
eliminate the potential to win even partial victories that actually benefit working people. So our Congress, state legislators, the electoral process, the Constitution, local governments, part of the state, are they used to legitimate an unconscionable system? Are they used by the ruling class to work out interclass differences? Or are they places where struggle can take place, victories can be won, and avenues of struggle that we must actively participate in? And the answer is yes, all of the above. It is all of those things. So this brings us to a central question of state power and the transition to socialism. Is there a peaceful electoral path to socialism? So uh, the bonus readings included some extensive quotes from a, a group called Line of March, which was a, a group that came out of the Maoist left of the 70s and uh, lasted for most of the 1980s, and I think had a more sophisticated critique of the Communist Party USA's uh, approach to questions of power. Um, and some of the people who were in it did very good work in working class communities, oppressed communities, uh, and uh, engaged in admirable work. Uh, they did not last, they lasted about 10 years, but from early on they had a critique. They, their journal was called Line of March, a journal of rectification, and most of their attempts at rectification were aimed at the CPUSA. So this was an article from the, I think, July-August issue 1980, uh, analyzing our general line. And it said, the CPUSA's opportunism is concentrated in its strategic line on peaceful transition to socialism and the illusions this line spreads within the working class. They claim that we distorted the central question of power and that our revisionism sapped the revolutionary essence from our program, leaving only disconnected and empty phrases about revolution and socialism. And while I disagree with their analysis and their position, I agree that they have here in this uh, in this particular article uh, highlighted the central question of the transition to socialism and what that means in terms of how we view the state, how we view state power, how we view the struggle for socialism, how we view connecting all of these. So I agree with them that this is the central question. I disagree with their approach to it, but that exemplifies why we need to discuss our position on the potential of a peaceful path to socialism in depth, not just as a slogan or taking it for granted, but explain it, especially to people who are newly involved in the struggle. We need to look in detail at the arguments uh, which claim that there is a violent and only a violent overthrow of capitalism is the only way to go and what we think those arguments miss. So opponents of the idea of a peaceful path note that no revolution has lasted that came to power by other than armed struggle. I could quibble with that, but for the most part that's actually true. Uh, they used Chile, what happened in the Allende's Chile in uh, 1970 to 73 and after, as an example of the futility of pursuing an electoral path, pointing out that the imposition of fascism by a threatened ruling class shows that socialists and communists winning elections will never work to transform society. Opponents of the idea point out that Eurocommunism from the 70s and 80s led to unprincipled compromises in legislative struggles in a vain attempt to win an electoral majority and point to the electrical, electoral alliances that some com European communist parties made with bankrupt socialist and social democratic parties in Europe which ultimately resulted in those communist parties losing a significant part of their popular support. Contrarily, proponents of a peaceful path point out that the only way the ruling class could stop the Allende government from gaining in the polls, winning more support from workers, and implementing more of its program was to institute fascism, and that this is a sign of the weakness of a system, not a strength. Proponents note that in almost revolution, all revolutions, the violence or almost all the violence starts 
with former ruling classes resorting to violence as a last resort. And this too is a sign of weakness, not a guarantee that a peaceful path does not exist. I will go into some examples of all of these. Uh, they use Chile, proponents of a peaceful path use Chile as an example of a radical coalition gaining a foothold on state power, though not full state power, and that they did this mainly through election, mainly though not only through election work. So we have these two competing visions of is a peaceful path possible. Going into some of these examples, uh, as I pointed out, Euro, the Euro communism, the French party, the Italian party, the Spanish party um, made focused themselves on legislative tactics and electoral tactics almost to the exclusion of other things and they ended up losing support from masses of workers rather than gaining strength um, and the the I've already talked I won't repeat myself about Chile we're going to go into that in a, uh, a bit more one of the failings of Eurocommunism, among others, was that it acted as if electoral and legislative work should override all other strategic considerations. They geared their strategy towards winning an electoral and legislative majority and winning power that way, and neglected other important aspects of the struggle, building grassroots working class power and organization, building struggle oriented coalitions rather than strictly electoral ones. Um, and some of those uh, some of those parties sacrificed um, principles in order to become part of the government or, main, uh, or win a temporary legislative advantage, uh, which proved to be futile in the long run. But really, when we're discussing is there a peaceful electoral path, there are really two questions which are related but separate. One, is there a peaceful path? And two, is there an electoral path? Uh, our party contends that elections by themselves are not a path to the fundamental socialist restructuring of the economy. That path also must consist of working class organization, coalition building, strikes, general strikes, mass demonstrations, community building, and policy successes based on local and regional electric, elect, election victories so that you demonstrate in practice what uh, uh, a people and working class led government will be like. But as we saw in Chile, the the ruling class, which was so threatened by the Allende government and by the popular unity coalition, which won, the, won his presidency, uh, they ended up uh, drowning that experiment in blood with the imposition of fascism by, led by General Pinochet. And there are many other examples, which I will go into a few more later. So if ruling classes and de deposed ruling classes use violence to reassert their power, should a revolutionary movement even try for a peaceful path? Should revolutionary movements just skip elections since they are doomed to failure? Are they doomed to failure? What about examples of revolutionary parties which used elections to achieve at least temporary victories, the Communist Party leading in the Indian state of Kerala, Indian and French CPs which won governments of many localities, uh, the government of Nepal currently, the Allende experiment, left governments in Venezuela, Brazil, Ecuador, Bolivia, Uruguay, and others. So is there ever, uh, and we have to ask, is there ever any peaceful path that doesn't involve elections? And there are a few examples of that, uh, very limited though. The Vietnamese Revolution of 1945, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit uh, later, uh, the revolution itself was very peaceful uh, because it happened while the Japanese occupying army was still uh, in control but had already been defeated so it was no longer exercising state power and before the French tried to reassert their colonial power there was a brief period when there was no 
united functioning state power and the peaceful revolution, mainly through a large demonstration, uh, changed the government. Uh, now, it, that later became a very violent, but the original revolution was not. There were also governments all over Eastern Europe, uh, which had transfers of power to the working class uh, to one degree or another, but they took power not as a result of an internal revolution, but due to armed occupation by the USSR. So should we try for a peaceful path or should we just skip elections? Are they doomed to failure? Here's another opportunity for uh, a few minutes, some minutes of discussion. So I'll turn it back to you, Dee. Okay, again, the floor is open for discussion. If you'd like to participate, please use your raised hand, just click your raised hand icon and I'll be able to locate and open your mic. Hank, your mic is open. Okay, um, just a couple of comments. Or, uh, I think it's obvious or should be obvious that a peaceful path to socialism is preferable simply because it's more humane, it's uh, less destructive. If you get involved in a situation like a uh, violent revolution, which essentially is civil war, there's going to be a lot of destruction, not only of human life, but there's going to be a lot of destruction of uh, the material conditions, of uh, infrastructure, productive forces, and so forth, uh, and a lot of bitterness, anger, and so forth, an emotional climate, which will make it that much more difficult to build socialism. On the other hand, I think we have to recognize that though we, we, we want a peaceful transition, uh, there's no guarantee. Uh, we have to be flexible and say, you know, if people ask us, we need to say we strongly prefer and we will work towards a peaceful path to socialism, but we can't guarantee it. Ultimately, it's, it's in the hands of the ruling class. Thanks. Okay, just to think just a minute and I will open. Is that Hobie or Hobby? Your mic is open. Hobie, your mic is open. Hobby, your mic is open. You just speak. You just need to speak now. Yeah. Okay, we'll go just a minute. We'll find someone else. Derek, your mic is open. You just need to click your mic and you can speak. There you are. Thank you very much first for recognizing me, Mr. Mark. Um, my comments is this. Um, I'm a um, retired staff, staff sergeant from the United States Army. I was deployed overseas in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, based on my, my former knowledge, um, I could say that any time, type of armed insurrection or revolution against this current government would have to be a asymmetric style warfare, something like what the Vietnamese did in Vietnam or what the insurgents were doing against us in Iraq or Afghanistan, which would be a long and prolonged engagement, something that would take probably upwards to 10 to 20 years. It's something that would be long in duration and would be kind of costly, something to what Hank said. Um, is it doable? Absolutely. Um, but it's one of those things that is last resort. Um, but is it something that I would support? Absolutely. Because at the end of the day, there's something deeply wrong with our system. And it's, I personally believe that is not going to be changed through elections. We've seen through the last election cycle in 2016 that there's something deeply wrong and corrupt with our election process. Uh, thanks. We'll take one more. John, your mic is open. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Mark. Um, 
really interesting presentation. I think uh, just a couple of things. One is I think you have to also take a look at how society has changed and even norms in society and maybe even particular the norms, uh, accepted norms um, of our own uh, society historically. And I, I say that because I think that as time goes on, uh, you know, as weak as they are and as limited as they are, democratic institutions have become deeply rooted <clears throat> and a democratic framework has become deeply rooted in the American psyche or whatever. And therefore, um, the role of elections, electoral processes, uh, along with other democratic institutions and norms is, is deeply accepted, you know, as part of our way of life. Um, so I don't, I don't think the American people would <clears throat> follow a, any other kind of path um, than a peaceful path, one that involves electoral politics. And as you pointed out, it's not it alone. I mean, it involves a lot of building grassroots power, you know, and, and struggle and, and so on. Um, the other point I just wanted to make was, um, you know, it's, we shouldn't look at it as what we would desire, but again, it's also what the masses of, of people, including the vast majority of people desire. And so our tactics also have to be geared toward that, um, including the coalition partners um, that we will be and are working with uh, in the course of this whole thing. We're not going to be doing this alone. Uh, we don't subscribe to the to the idea, at least I don't, of a vanguard party. Um, you know, we have to earn our, our leadership, but at the same time, we work in coalition with, with a whole other set of groups that are dedicated toward uh, some kind of socialist transition. At least that's the way it'll it'll emerge, you know. So uh, the, the aim is to develop this very broad, extremely broad mass majority movement and tendencies toward violence, I think, narrow that down considerably. Thanks. I think we have time for a couple more if there are others who want to chime in. Okay. Um, I encourage the women who are uh, participating to raise their hand as well. Ken, your mic is open. You just have to click your mic. Ken, your mic is open. Yes. Greetings, there. comrades. Greetings. Can you hear me there? Yes. My question deals with a variant, I think. We are confronting a number of people on the internet who are posing that we are the reactionaries in all ways. But in looking at the entire world movement, the revolutionary structures that we have presently, it appears as if those revolutionary structures aren't claiming that we are reactionary, nor are we revisionists in the ways that we're being posed. My basic question goes to how is it that we could hack these thought patterns, these ideological innuendos that even if you provide, and this is true, I've tried it, that even if you provide direct quotes of a peaceful and an armed revolutionary path, that it is rejected still. How is it we get to move those personnel to our area? Are they lost? And then in the long run, Looking at how the generalized United States population operates, and then the same people are saying that they are reactionary, don't have a class consciousness, don't have the ability to see the revolution being presently available. How is it that we get those people to then see that the entire class of the workers are not in? sort of a, a sleep state of some sort, that they are struggling at all times. And believe it or not, this came up at a recent meeting where some people who claim that they're Marxists say that class struggle, just as one level of it, doesn't exist in the United States. <laughs> apparently incorrect, 
thought from my direction. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let me let me respond to a couple of these. Uh, first, uh, I want to thank Hank because uh, he's he he used the words "no guarantee," which will come up in a a slide very soon. Um, the, uh, the preference, what we are working for, is not the same as being able to give a guarantee. Um, to Derek, I would say that uh, he, he points out that the truth is that the state will, the capitalist state will always have more firepower than we do. And this issues of an armed insurrection have been complicated tremendously by the fact that the nature of weaponry has changed. We're not dealing with the same kind of weaponry that uh, the 1848 revolution in, revolutions in Germany um, were confronting. Um, so that has to be, we have to be aware of that. That's the, the, the ability to um, mechanize and automate uh, um, weapons of mass destruction against uh, the populace is uh, qualitatively different than it used to be. I would, um, though that is not by itself an argument that armed insurrection can never work or should never be tried. And we'll go into that a little bit more. I, I do want to to disagree a little bit when he says he doesn't think that uh, things can be changed through elections. I think, uh, in agreeing with uh, John Bactell, that one way to look at U.S. history is as a prolonged struggle to extend democracy from the original voters being only white male property owners of a certain age uh, and to continual struggle to expand the electorate, to uh, make it possible for everyone to vote. Um, and that's a deep part of our history. That is part of the way in which democracy and the fight for democracy is deeply rooted. If we only look at our elections as they were held in 2016, absolutely, by itself, if nothing else changes, that's not a way to create fundamental change. But the fight for better democracy, the fight for more democracy, the fight against attempts to restrict democracy. I think those are a key and crucial part of the battle that we want to make. And that's part of building the movement that is capable of creating change through elections, through mass demonstrations, through strikes, through general strikes, through all those other means of struggle, in addition to the electoral. Uh, if we only look at, if we look at the elections as an unchanging static thing, then we'd be stuck. But that's not true. We are capable of waging a battle for a more complete democracy and for extending democracy beyond political democracy into economic democracy. And John is absolutely right. It's not just about what we want. It's about what the allies and the people we are working with and the people we want to win want. And they want the possibility of a peaceful path. We can't guarantee that that will be the case, I don't believe, but we definitely can, uh, uh, that can be our aim and what we work for and how we organize ourselves and what we, um, uh, sort of the program that we put forward for change. Uh, to Ken, I would say, um, the, the, the answer is there. there is no way successful guaranteed way to attack some of those thought patterns that we run across on the internet or among people who are uh, newly entered into the struggle and don't have their own deep political experience to draw from. But the answer is not in better arguments with them. The answer is in the struggle. The answer is focusing on the masses of workers. The action of the masses of the workers is what will convince people that there is really a class struggle when the nurses in West, when the, the teachers in West Virginia and then three or four other states go out in massive strikes and uh, try to occupy the state capitals and uh, force Republican governors to make major concessions. That's the class struggle in action and that's what will convince people. Real life is what will convince people. They're, part of what we can do is 
do educational work like we are doing today, engage in discussion and education and debate and promoting our ideas. But by itself, I'm always contended that we cannot preach our way to socialism. It's only struggle that will do it. It is only the movement itself that will do it. And that is the real answer uh, to those people. And the only thing ultimately that will convince most of them is that the struggle itself, uh, we, we learn and the masses of workers learn and people that we might disagree with in some way also learn based on the real life struggles of millions and millions of people. And changing that dynamic uh, is, the, I think, the way to go because it's not a matter of debate. The debate is not about abstract ideas. The debate is really about the course of real life and only real life will convince some people that they're wrong and some people will never be convinced. Um, so I'm moving on a little. Um, and I think we're going well, so there will be uh, maybe some a uh, fair amount of time at the end to engage in more discussion and for more people to chime in and state their opinions or agreements or disagreements or questions. So I want to make the point that just because we uh, believe in the potential of a peaceful path and work to make it happen, that doesn't mean we're pacifists. There are certainly times when armed struggle is the only alternative, as for example in South Africa during the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, where the African National Congress and the Communist Party of South Africa set up Spear of the Nation, an armed wing of the ANC, which was headed for many years by Joe Slovo, a white South African communist. Armed struggle was the only alternative because a fascist government had uh, prevent, you know, closed off all po potential or almost all potential, not all potential, but much of the potential for peaceful struggle and for any other opposition and, and uh, demonstrative action. Uh, so that's why they came to the conclusion that armed struggle was a necessary thing for them to engage in at that point. Uh, so there are times when that is the case. Uh, and then that can change. For example, in South Africa during the 1990s, there was a combination of the pressures from internal resistance, from the armed actions of the ANC and Spirit of the Nation, from international boycotts, from internal political pressure, and more that came to bear on the apartheid regime. And the potential opened up uh, for negotiations with a hated, vicious, fascist regime. And the ANC and the South African Communist Party seized that opportunity to negotiate with them and create a space for relatively free elections and for a transformation and to move their struggle from an armed struggle to one that uh, was largely expressed through electoral struggle. So in South Africa, we've seen both the times when armed struggle was a necessary choice and the times when the necessary choice was to change that. So we should ask, are armed revolutionary movements wrong who have given up armed struggle to participate in the electoral process? We have the ANC and the South African Communist Party as one example, but it's also happened in Colombia and in El Salvador and some other countries that Emil might know more about than I do. Uh, are they wrong to shift? They're already engaged in armed struggle and they shift to electoral struggle. What do you think? Okay, the floor is open for discussion again. And uh, I'm looking for um, Jared, your mic is open. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So, um, Mark, I just wanted to ask your thoughts on the recent socialist risings within the Democratic Party that are starting to separate themselves a little bit more from the mainstream politics. Um, we're starting to see uh, some more socialist sentiments down in the uh, Midwest, which is a notorious region for Republican sentiments. Um, now, in regards to the electoral process, I think it's becoming more apparent now 
as to what Americans need and want, um, especially in regards to universal health care and uh, education. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on this um, recent rising in socialist sentiments in the uh, American political scene. Okay. I'll take others uh, and then respond. Just a moment. Lowell, your mic is open. Hi, Mark. It's Lowell again. Um, to the question up here on the board now, um, I just finished reading a biography of Chris Hanes, the uh, assassinated head of the South African Communist Party, and he was against, um, to your question, our armed revolutionary movements wrong to go the peaceful process. He was against putting down the arms, but um, as he says, like a good soldier, he followed what Mandela and the white government decided and, um, you know, put down his arms. The FARC, as we know, um, made a peace agreement with the government and their leadership started getting assassinated. Um, and then the new incoming president has, um, making talks about changing the terms of the deal um, now that they have no arms. So I think those are um, points to bring up. And just to jump back a little bit, um, just to put a rhetorical question out there to you, if you want to answer it now and I answer it all, mm -hmm. why don't we talk about the proponents of the peaceful path of the revolution that you're not talking about? That is the bourgeois revolutions of North America and Western Europe. Those revolutions were all armed revolutions, and no one in history speaks about if there were any people talking about a peaceful path at that time, we don't discuss them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, let's see. Steve, your mic is open. <clears throat> Hello. Hello. Uh, thanks a lot for the webinar. Uh, my statement is, is that the class struggle takes place in many, many forms. I do not believe that the American working class is going to uh, take up an armed struggle or any other struggle unless the electoral struggle uh, has been exhausted. And uh, one of the big problems of our current situation is that only something like 11% of the uh, non-public working class is actually organized into unions. In other words, involved in any kind of organized class struggle. And I see that before any of these things happen, that we're going to have to go back to uh, what we did during the, the time of the formation of the CIO and go out and reinvigorate our labor movement and organize the working class into a class struggle so that they can see directly that they actually have a class consciousness and an opposition to the capitalist class. Unfortunately, I don't think that too many people right now see that aspect. So I think that the class struggle has to take place on every single uh, battlefield that presents itself. That's my rant. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, let's take one more. Vaughn, your mic is open. You have to click your mic on your end. Vaughn, your mic is open. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mark, first of all, uh, this is one of the best presentations uh, I've ever uh, listened in on. It's well organized and well presented, and I thank you for that. Uh, the first point I'd like to make is that the, the road uh, toward a, an electoral or parliamentary approach is, I think, serves the purpose of propagating our message to the general public, to the masses, to the electorate, to advance the ideas of Marxism, 
not necessarily to try to capture the capitalist state and try to convert that into a worker state, but it does serve the purpose of allowing us in a somewhat democratic and increasingly less free society to get the message out. As far as armed struggle, I don't think it's an alternative one or the other. Armed struggle is a matter of timing, and Lenin made that point, as you have, uh, very clearly. The July days before the Russian Revolution was premature. It was only until later when the Soviets, which were under the control of the Mensheviks, later on swung around to the Bolshevik position because they had lost faith in the Mensheviks and the, the provisional government. Then the timing was correct. And when the troops that were sympathetic to the Bolsheviks refused to be stationed uh, outside of Petrograd, and they came around to the Bolshevik position, that's when armed struggle, it's a matter of timing, that's when it became appropriate to do so. So I would say that it's not a question of either or, it's a question of timing. And uh, this entire episode, I think, is best addressed uh, by uh, Lev Trotsky in Lessons of October. Keep in mind that even though the state has all of the, the weapons uh, to suppress the masses, they have not only the uh, artillery and the guns, now they have the surveillance state, they have drones, they have a lot more than they ever had, as you mentioned, in 1848. However, we are many, they are few. And what swung around uh, the, the chance for the, for the communists in Russia to succeed is the fact that the troops that were, the very troops that were part of the original czarist state and then the provisional government, they swung around to, the, to support the, the uprising. And based upon the fact that they lost faith in both the Tsar and the provisional government, uh, they became the weapons of success for the Bolshevik revolution. Again, thank you uh, for this presentation. I think it should be made readily available. There should be a library where, in the future, anyone who wants to listen to this presentation can do so. Thank you. Well, thanks. Uh, just a couple of responses. Uh, I think the upsurge in socialist sentiment, uh, particularly among the youth, is an extremely positive development. It is at the start of changing the national discourse about socialism, about what constitutes mainstream politics and what constitutes real solutions. Um, and so I think it's tremendously positive. I think it is also leading to a struggle within the Democratic Party between establishment forces and capitalist forces and uh, democratic socialists and people who are just progressive and looking for a thoroughgoing alternative. That was very obvious during the Sanders campaign that there was a hunger among tens of millions of people for a real alternative to politics as usual. And that bodes well for our future opens up many possibilities of struggle. Uh, however, there isn't anything automatic or guaranteed about progress. We don't know uh, who's in these internal struggles in the Democratic Party, who's going to win and who's going to lose and when and on what basis. There will be local victories and national defeats and, and vice versa. Um, so while I think it's tremendously positive and opens many doors uh, and uh, I, I think it's, uh, uh, we, we shouldn't be complacent about it. It requires organization. It requires also that some of those millions of people becoming activated gain their own experience in struggle, um, learn the lessons of running up against the system and what you can win from it and what, what it will stop you from doing. Um, and this is why this question of 
state power and our understanding of it and approach to it is important. This is one of the differences between our party and some others on the left, uh, progressives and democratic socialists and other groups that call themselves Marxists is understanding that while, for example, a political program which we would advocate uh, from a candidate from our party running for office might not be appreciably different in any way, shape, or form from some of the democratic socialists who are running uh, and winning. Uh, our long-range view says t helps us understand that until there is a fundamental transfer of state power, all victories will be under attack, all victories will be partial, all victories will be limited, and it requires a fundamental shift, not just an incremental or evolutionary shift, but a fundamental shift of power uh, to bring about fundamental change in the economy and in our politics and in our culture. So I think it's, it's uh, you know, a tremendously positive and, and very hopeful. Uh, talking about Chris Hani, uh, I should note that six months before he was assassinated, he came on a West Coast tour for the then West Coast paper of our party, The People's World. Uh, he came to Seattle, where I helped organize uh, an event for him. We had a couple of hundred people honoring him, and he spoke very eloquently. Uh, and the examples you use, both of Chris Hani talking, you know, um, being ready to follow discipline and lay down his arms when when that was what the the collective decision was, but also the examples in Colombia that there is you can make a decision to shift to electoral struggle. That doesn't mean that agreements with capitalist states won't go bad. Uh, they can they can, they can reverse it. The only answer is more struggle. That's the only guarantee. Um, and I agree absolutely with Steve that the class struggle takes many forms and it would be a mistake for us to abandon any of those fields of struggle. This is one of the reasons why even if you don't think that elections are the way to create fundamental change, we should engage in electoral struggle. It is an, a field of struggle on which ideas and solutions and uh, the, the nature of the debate are shaped, the understanding and the ideas of millions of people, and we need to be on that field of struggle. Uh, I, I agree with you that the, the US working class or any working class is not going to take up arms unless other less um, risky methods of struggle are exhausted. Um, and certainly we wouldn't advocate that they do so. Um, we, we don't advocate struggle for the sake of struggle or a particular tactic just for the sake of the tactic. There have been times when, uh, for example, I was a, a, a state employee and there were a couple of times during the 70s where my state union held a vote on whether um, we should authorize a strike. And in one of those cases, uh, the, the communists advocated uh, the, a yes vote and Two years later, we advocated a no vote because the political and economic situation had changed. We didn't advocate a strike just because we're in favor of strikes in the abstract. A strike and what people learn from it depends on the real actual conditions. And absolutely, we need mass unionization. And that's that, that mass struggle is the real answer. If we won electoral, vic electoral victories with young, vibrant democratic socialists winning victories in local and national elections all over the country, and it wasn't backed up with mass unionization, with mass demonstrations, with mass organization, with mass struggle, with coalitions around many issues and coalitions of coalitions, those electoral victories wouldn't have the same meaning. We have, they have to be backed up by the actual power of the working class. And absolutely, Vaughn, the, uh, uh, sorry about that. That's my phone, which I'm using to time my uh, presentation, but it's also, um, I'm part of the farmer's market here and people are communicating about that. So that's what the little beep beep is, uh, texts on my phone. Um, 
an approach to electoral struggle and using that as an opportunity to spread our message is exactly why. And it also, an approach to arguing for a peaceful path challenges uh, the common preconception in this country promoted by the ruling class that revolutionaries are only interested in violent revolution and that that's our our goal we make clear that our goal is the fundamental transformation of the economy and society not how we do that and that our not only our preference but the preference of our allies and the preference of the people we are seeking to win to our side is to do so by peaceful means understanding that that is not a guarantee but that is our aim we learn uh from the struggle and uh so in the in the russian revolution winning over the troops was a a, a key factor or if you read borstein's book allende's chile which i will again recommend uh he discusses the problems, the tactical problems they had in trying to reach the masses of the armed forces. Um, and he, there are some risks that they didn't take and shouldn't have, and some risks that they didn't take but they should have in trying to reach the masses of the troops. And reaching the masses of the troops is not separate from reaching the masses of the people. When there is a mass of people's movement, that affects the foot, the foot soldiers. Okay, I'm going to move along now a little. Um, so here we get back to that, uh, that those words that that Hank mentioned, is working for a peaceful path, a guarantee of peace. Str any struggle, whether it's for the fundamental transformation or for a strike, don't come with guarantees. We don't enter into the struggle knowing for certain how it's going to turn out. It also doesn't come with a guarantee because much of the violence in socialist revolutions since, and even including the October Revolution in Russia, uh, that violence has come from the actions of the dispossessed former ruling class, which starts a civil war, and or it has come from imperialist interventions of many kinds. As I pointed out in Vietnam, it was the French trying to reimpose colonial rule uh, allied with the US trying to build an anti-communist alliance. Uh, so that was mainly imperialist intervention in that case. There are other cases as in the revolution in Russia where it was both uh, the start of a civil war from internal actors and imperialist invasion from 14 countries including the US. So seeking a peaceful path is a strategy, not a guarantee. And our goal has to be to win a large enough majority to make it politically unfeasible for the capitalists to start violence, to create a positive balance of forces, there's that, those, that phrase again, in favor of fundamental change that is strong enough and massive enough to make it a futile effort for them to start a civil war or engage in violence. And whether we will be able to do that or not, we can't tell at this point, but that has to be our goal. Pursuing a peaceful path has the aim of winning a majority of workers to active support for the revolution, has the aim of winning as many allies as possible to support revolutionary change, to accomplish our common goals, seeks to place the onus of initiating violence squarely where it belongs on the capitalist class and on the course of apparatus of the capitalist state. And it also stresses the humanistic aspects of our goals and our desire for a peaceful transition. To reiterate, a peaceful path includes but is not limited to electoral struggle. And that it has proven to be a mistake to focus on electoral and legislative struggles to such a degree that they supersede all other forms of struggle and importance. They are very important, but they're not solely important. And working for a peaceful path doesn't mean we are pacifists or that we are opposed to all armed struggle or all, all armed self-defense. We're not trying to prescribe a path for every single communist party in every single country in the world, which have wildly different circumstances. We're talking about what what is uh, matches the political circumstances in which we find ourselves in this country. 
We also understand that electoral victories for socialists, unless they are sufficiently massive, don't represent seizing state power. They represent, as they did in Chile, winning a foothold on state power, the opportunity to build a large enough majority through the process of governing and continuing to campaign for socialism. And all this is because state power in Marxist terms is a unity of opposites, a unity and struggle of opposites. State power is the legal framework to maintain class rule. It is the course of apparatus of class rule. It is also opportunities for democratic struggle, organization and protest. And it is also contains aspects of both democratic participation and limits on democratic participation. So when I say that most of the violence and revolutions comes from the ruling class, here's some examples. Chile was an obvious example with the imposition of fascism. Another was the Spanish Civil War. The um, government, uh, the popular government in Spain and that won in 1936 was opposed uh, by the military uh, allied with uh, uh, Italian and German fascism uh, in trying to impose fascism in Spain. Uh, and that wasn't even a socialist government. It was a government which had in which socialists and communists participated, but it they didn't they didn't control state power. They had won an election and were fighting for a better life for the Spanish people. And violence was initiated by the former ruling class and by the military. Uh, the civil war in Russia following the revolution, the ruling the the violence during the actual Russian Revolution itself was, while real, fairly minor. Most of the, the violence and death and destruction came from imperialist intervention and from uh, civil war by members of the various segments of the military. I've already discussed the Vietnamese Revolution. The Bay of Pigs is another example of ruling class initiating violence. Other examples are imposition of fascism and near fascism in an effort to prevent left wing victories, electoral and otherwise. Greece in the 1960s, Brazil in the 1970s, Portugal just before World War II, South Africa imposing the legal system of apartheid, which was uh, it was already a vicious system, and then in the early 50s, they made it even more vicious and propped it up with even more legal justifications and uh, armed repression. Uh, Germany in the 1930s, Italy in the 1920s. Italy in the 1920s was a hotbed of radical action, uh, especially in the north, in the industrial areas. and. The imposition of Italian fascism uh, was an effort to forestall that from uh, gaining uh, more victories and winning more uh, support from the working class. Uh, Japan also with their military conquests all over Asia and Southeast Asia. There are also instances not necessarily of just of violence, but of an imperialist power, namely the US, intervening in or subverting elections to prevent left-wing victories. Italy and France following World War II, preventing the Geneva Accord mandated elections in Vietnam during the mid-1950s, the invasion and CIA-sponsored coups against legitimate left governments in Iran, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Grenada, Venezuela, uh, and in Chile before fascism, there was not only did the US play a role in um, creating the circumstances in which a, the imposition of fascism could happen, but during the late 60s, when they saw which way it was going, they attempted to support the opponents of the popular unity coalition in an attempt to prevent them from gaining a victory. So those are both violence and anti-democratic interventions in elections. 
Uh, I need to edit this out. I've talked too many times about the Vietnamese Revolution, uh, but there have also been imperialist support for right-wing nationalist armed struggles against left movements and governments. Angola during the 1980s, the Contras in Nicaragua are two examples. The U.S. has also trained military, paramilitary, and police forces in methods of forcible repression. Uh, the School of the Americas being a prime example, or the CIA efforts to train the Brazilian military during the 1970s. Imperialists also use their intelligence apparatus against popular resistance movements, such as the CIA informing the South African government of the whereabouts of Nelson Mandela so he could be arrested, uh, where, whereupon he spent 27 years in prison. So. We've talked a little bit and mentioned a little bit about fascism. The question of fascism is also a question about state power. So I want to talk a little bit about formulation so we, uh, we're we clear about what we're talking about. There, There is fascism, there are fascists, there are authoritarians, um, there are totalitarians. These are all terms that get thrown around a lot today and we should have a clear understanding in our minds when we talk about it. In my opinion, in the opinion of my party, we don't have fascism. However, we do have fascists in seats of power and influence. Trump, Bannon, Miller, Sessions, DeVos, Bolton, media figures like Hannity and Limbaugh, to name just a few of the very revolting characters that we have uh, operating at the pinnacle of our political system at the moment. So we do have fascists who are in seats of power. We also do have actual fascist policies in action, ripping babies from their parents, installing a permanent reactionary majority on the Supreme Court, uh, bills introduced in many state legislatures to criminalize protest, to make it legal for people to run down protesters with their cars. Um, there are now calls by some to kill opponents of Trump. These are fascist policies being advocated and being imposed. And these and others are steps towards fascism that are happening right now, which we need to fight before it gets to fascism, such as restrictions on voting rights, normalizing the inhumanity of the immigration policy, destroying union rights, demonizing entire groups, whipping up nationalist and militarist hysteria. But if we confuse fascists and fascist policies with full-blown fascism, we won't take full advantage of the democratic space remaining to defeat them. This is relevant to our discussion of state power because having fascists in place enacting their agenda, laying the basis for full-blown fascism is not the same as fascism with full state power, with complete authority to terrorize the entire population and militarily crush all forms of protest and op op opposition. We should have no illusions. Full-blown fascism is where the fascists want to lead the country. And that would not just be a continuation of business as usual, that would be even worse than our current political situation. For revolutionaries and for progressives and for even just basic decent human beings, defending every inch of democracy, limited and insufficient though it might be, is part of the struggle to defeat fascism and part of the struggle to um, shift the whole paradigm to a positive struggles for real and fundamental solutions. Some allies in our fight to keep the fascists from gaining full-blown state power are working class allies who will be fundamental allies uh, uh, all through the struggle for socialism and beyond. Some allies are progressives who may or may not be allies all the way to socialism, but are united in many sides of the struggle for democracy, for people's rights, for programs to benefit the vast majority. And some allies in the fight against fascism are only what Lenin called temporary vacillating allies who oppose fascism from the perspective of sections of the ruling class. 
Some of those sections prefer to rule using limited democracy and limited to concessions to workers and poor people. Some understand that fascism means the destruction of protections for the interests of some sectors of capital. Fascism is not uh, the universal preference of the entire capitalist class. There will be some capitalists who will suffer uh, if fascism is fully imposed, and some of them understand that. And some understand that fascism means destroying the possibility of social peace, and that will hurt them bottom, their bottom line, particularly some sections of capital that rely on consumer spending, which that's a sort of a general guideline, not a, a law or a, a, a prediction of how any particular individual will, capitalist will approach it. But some sectors understand that when uh, there are more benefits for people and when the minimum wage goes up, that means more people to buy more goods. And they understand that fascism is actually the imposition of power by the most reactionary, most militarist uh, sections of the capitalist class, and that won't benefit all capitalists. But they are temporary vacillating allies, not permanent allies for all of the struggles we need to engage in. Fascism results, full-blown fascism, results from a struggle for state power. This brings us back to the issue that we're here to talk about, the state. In order to enshrine the dictatorship of the most militaristic, most terrorist, most inhumane, most vicious sections of capital, that's the goal of the struggle for fascist state power. In order to prevent any option for successful protest or opposition, in order to destroy any institutional or limits of decency on the impositions of inhumane policy. They understand that fascism also comes as a result of attacking other elements of the ruling class who don't want fascism. If you go back and read some of Trump's speeches from the 2016 elections, he was attacking various sections of the capitalist class who, were, who weren't ready to uh, jump behind him and support him. It was a struggle within the capitalist class as well as a struggle within the population as a whole. And their goal is to destroy all organizations and institutions capable of resistance. And we can see this because in almost every case, after fascists seize state power, they outlaw unions, outlaw all other political parties, outlaw all protest, and they institutionalize vicious, inhumane oppression against all opponents and against oppressed groups. We can also, also see that now in the uh, efforts to take steps to lead up to fascism the attacks on ACORN, on the ability of unions to participate in elections, on Planned Parenthood, on many other people's organizations are not just political or cultural war things, they are efforts um, to undercut institutions which are capable of resistance. So just as fascism is a struggle for state power, so too socialism is a struggle for state power. It is a battle to suppress the ability of the dispossessed ruling class, that says disposed, dispossessed ruling class to return to power. It's a fight to replace and or transform the apparatus of state power into instruments of people's power. It is a struggle to stop and then eliminate the course of instruments of state power from being used against the democratic power of the people. It's a struggle to extend democracy, to create not only full political democracy, but to extend that democracy into our economic life. Socialism seeks the power to transform political, economic, legal, cultural, and educational life and make those positive changes permanent so that benefits and rights for the people are not subject to the next election majority to make fundamental changes relatively irreversible. It's not as simple as the slogan, smash the state. 
for example, in the early 1920s, after the Civil War was won by the Bolsheviks, under Lenin's leadership, the USSR adopted the new economic policy, which among other things, made concessions to foreign companies and to engineers and specialists in order to improve the economy quickly, even though they had full state power and needed to transform or, um, or break and create a new, new administration and management. They needed the expertise and investment and technical knowledge and experience of companies and experts. We could not just smash those. We needed, uh, they needed to make concessions to gain the support of people enough to fundamentally change the economy, which was in shambles. As somebody pointed out earlier, uh, when, when there's a, a violent civil war, the material conditions of life, uh, many of the, the factories and uh, uh, ways in which social life functions were destroyed and needed to be recreated. So we didn't couldn't just smash the state. We needed to find ways uh, to utilize the technical experience and expertise and machinery and investment. And Lenin saw enough uh, that saw that well enough to make a basic change in Bolshevik policy in the early 20s, uh, about 1922, I think. For another take on this, this goes back to Engels who said, after the victory of the proletariat, the only organization the victorious working class finds ready-made for use is that of the state. It may require adaption to the new functions, adaptation to the new functions, but to destroy it at such a moment would be to destroy the only organism by means of which the victorious working class can exert its new power keep its enemies down and carry out the economic revolution of society. So while we need to fundamentally transform some elements of state power and eliminate others, uh, we can't just uh, get rid of all of it. We need to find them, those ready made to use and use them for a totally different purpose than they were originally intended. So socialism at the start must be about transforming or replacing existing state institutions in order to change their functions to serve the working class and also in order to protect the existence of working class state power. So we have about 15 minutes for some more discussion. What are your questions, your comments or disagreements? what needs more explanation in future presentations. Uh, and then for the last few minutes, we'll come back and I'll do a little bit of a summary and a response to the comments that you make now. The floor is open. Okay, Bernard, your hand keeps going up and then going down and going up. So we, and now it's down. So I'm scrolling past your name. If you'd like to speak, there you go again. So I'm gonna open your mic. Bernard, your mic is open. You need to open your mic. There you are. Okay, well, uh, first, thank you very much. A wonderful presentation. I know a lot of work went into it. It's a very difficult subject. I know there's a lot of different opinions on these questions. And I agree in the main with a lot of what you say. But the one thing that we're really not talking about is the social democratic deviation that you can build socialism under capitalism. And you just brought it up here with Ingalls on his quote about the new state and destruction of the state. Uh, in fact, it was the only change that was made in the Communist Manifesto after the Paris Commune that the state apparatus of the capitalists could not be used by the working class. And that was the only thing that Marx changed. It was a very important change. And it was certainly uh, uh, supported by Lenin and other revolutionaries. So the real question is, is that the capitalist state how we come to the revolution is one thing, and, and, and certainly we use all different forms. No one would disagree with that, and we always try to seek a peaceful uh, uh, way. No one disagrees with that either, but the problem is you cannot take over the bourgeois state and begin to use it in the interest of the working class, and that's very clear by every single Marxist leader, and Engels' quote on, that you just gave on the state is about the proletarian state 
not the bourgeois state. And he's very clear that, and that's in an argument against the anarchists who say that they don't need a state at all. And he's saying that there has to be a state and it's a proletarian state and it has to be used to suppress the uh, capitalist. Now, as far as the NEP and all of this is concerned, that's a different question. And of course, communists sometimes have to retreat, et cetera. And like you said earlier, it's based on the, uh, it's based on the uh, balance of forces. But the major question here for us and with DSA is can socialism be built under capitalism? And I think for communists, the answer is no. It doesn't mean we don't run in electoral campaigns, et cetera. Um, so I, I think this is the real question here. The state itself has to be dismantled uh, in some way. And there's two things when we talk about socialism, people just sort of say it's one subject. There's actually two subjects. The first subject is the state, and that is primarily the struggle for democracy. And, and we don't, we have a bourgeois democracy and every gain we have is forced on them and they take it away at the next possibility. Only the proletariat state, state power and the use of force uh, will, will make the bourgeois demands uh, you know, uh, permanent. The second question is the economy, and that's socialism. And that's something that can only be really enacted and furthered under the, uh, what we call, I guess, under Marxist terms, the dictatorship of the proletariat or the workers' power. And so I'd like you to sort of um, talk about that just a little bit and see what your thoughts are. But anyway, thank you. It's a wonderful presentation. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Dan, your mic is open. Open your mic on your end. Just click your mic on your end. Dan, your mic is open. There you are. Hi. Um, you said that um, we can't guarantee a peaceful means. And I understand that uh, we can't guarantee that some things are completely out of our hands. They're going to happen. It's just going to be part of uh, of how things unfold. But it also sounds a little bit like we're saying that we want to reserve uh, the opportunity, if we need, uh, to use a violent struggle. I want to say that I don't believe that the times that we currently live in, uh, in the United States at least, will tolerate a violent structure, uh, struggle. I think that the um, the left uh, in the uh, United States has come to identify very strongly with nonviolence, especially with the uh, nonviolence of uh, Martin Luther King Jr. as an example. And while today we have so many examples of right wing violence, the thing that happened in Charlotte, Charlottesville. The thing that uh, you know, the school violence uh, that's taking place. I don't believe that the spirit of the times that we live in uh, will tolerate violence. And if we, in some way, were to promote an armed struggle, I think that in many ways that would end up being the death knell for uh, uh, the left in the United States. That's just the thing the right wants to grab a hold of is that we've committed an act of violence, that we took the opportunities for peaceful struggle and somehow perverted it and became uh, the violent force there because they're already saying that that's who we are. They're, they're lying. They're, they're, that's erroneous. That's how the, you know, most cases of, of violence, uh, mass violence uh, are, is coming from the right. But they want to say that it's us, and if we give them the opportunity, they're going to run with that. I think that's uh, right now that uh, the uh, people won't tolerate a, a violent revolution, so we have to find other ways of struggle. You say it's not just through uh, electoral struggle, but I think there's other ways besides electoral. I agree with you that we can struggle. We can become part of protest. We can testify on whatever. We can be involved in the local level, at the school board, wherever. Even on social media, we can we can struggle. Anyway, that that's what I wanted to uh, add today. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, maybe we could take one or two more and then I'll respond and then there'll be a little more time for more comments too. 
Gary, your mic is open. Yes, yeah, so this is Gary. Mark, hey, thanks Gary. a lot. And this is um this is really this is really a stupendous presentation. And yeah, it needs it needs to be uh, reproduced. The thing you've left out of this whole discussion so far is what are the historical what are the historical laws of social dynamics in the United States? What's the relationship of political political violence to electoral politics to general to you know to labor struggles to community organizing? Um, what are the what are the lessons of the 1850s and 1860s that laid down sort of laid down some very fundamental laws about how that takes place in this country? Um, and I think I think we need to. We don't have time to talk about that here, but I think there needs to be. There probably needs to be a special session of uh, on Marxism in the state about what exactly have we learned from the experiences of our country on this stuff. Uh, secondly, I used to be a member of the Lion of March, and at some point I would offline. I would love to get. I would love to get together with you and talk about some things that I think um, need to be added to your uh, argument. <laughs> okay. That's it. Okay. Let me uh, read uh, uh, what uh, B offers. Uh, she wrote, um, state violence today includes weapons of mass destruction up to and including nuclear weapons. I agree that a revolution led by a pro-socialism coalition is the only way to win power and end capitalism. But how do we deal with the technically advanced violence that the capitalist may unleash, not by training an underground militia? Uh, exclamation point. So that's B. Lumpkin, who okay. is with us today. And I'm scrolling. Um, to Okay, Timothy, your mic is open. Yeah. Um, so one thing that came to mind, uh, after a trip to Russia uh, and talking with people there, uh, they said, uh, one old lady said that uh, communism wasn't everything they expected it to be, but capitalism was everything they expected it to be. And I think uh, <laughs> when, uh, when they're talking about um, democratic movements or mil militaristic movements uh, towards communism, I think that maybe taking a slower democratic process might behoove us. Um, I think that any time and just using Russia as an example, anytime there's a shock therapy uh, done to the economy or to the society, I think that's where it's spelled a little bit of trouble. But I would like to hear um, a contrasting argument to that or perhaps hear where I'm wrong. But uh, excellent presentation. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, let me respond and then there'll be a few more minutes for some other comments. Um, uh, Bernard, I see I my take on that this question of of the the state and eliminating the bourgeois state uh, a little a little differently because as i was saying earlier the the state comprises many aspects and they are not all identical and not all the same we might need to smash certain of the police forces or intelligence forces but we might need to adapt and alter local school boards i you know I'm, I'm just saying that they're not all identical and not all uh they do not all have the same purpose in the this society and they some of them are amenable to being transformed and some of them are impossible to transform we don't have to smash every single thing that might have some function in the current state we have to smash some of them some of them need to be eliminated uh, and my take on the evolution and revolution is this or reform and revolution is that it's not one or the other it's both if we are for example if we are able to win universal health care before socialism 
we won't have to smash the universal health care that we have won. We'll have to find a way to improve it and redirect it and um, make, make it uh, uh, better in uh, innumerable ways, but we won't necessarily have to destroy it. So does that mean we don't have to destroy the bourgeois state? Of course, the CIA, the NSA, the police forces, the, the private prison complex, all of those are things that need to be destroyed, but not every single aspect of government will need to be. Um, and fighting for reforms and for evolutionary change is a positive step. We shouldn't confuse that with revolution. We should make clear that there, there is a point at which we have to actually seize state power. We can't just evolve our way to it, but we can evolve some of these institutions in a progressive direction. And um, so I, I think we need to see both sides of that. Um, yeah, um, to Dan about uh, that we, we shouldn't absolutely, the whole point of my discussing that the potential of a peaceful path is so that we don't promote or advocate violent struggle. We're, we're not doing that. However, it's not that we're reserving the option of violence saying, well, if we don't get our way one way, we'll try it the other way. It's that if the ruling class resorts to violence, we need to be ready to defend ourselves. We need to be def ready to defend the people of this country. We need to be able to defend working class victories. That's not keeping the option of violence in a reserve as, well, maybe we'll go that way instead. We need to be ready uh, part of part of preventing violence, in fact, is being ready to meet it if it is meted upon the working class. Um, I just and I while I agree with you that um, at at the present moment and at the present time, the working class in this country would is not interested in would not tolerate the promotion of uh, armed insurrection in any way, shape, or form. We should also recognize that change is the only constant in this universe. Uh, example I go back to in my own life is what happened during what well, some of the things that happened during Watergate. It went from 1970, the end of 1972, Nixon being reelected in a comparative landslide to a year later, a majority of the country wanting him impeached. That was a very quick shift, a very fundamental shift in the way tens and tens of millions of people thought. So the fact that that is, I agree with you, that's how people think now, we don't know what the situation will present in the future. So while we shouldn't advocate for or promote violent struggle, uh, we can't say that exactly how everybody thinks right now is the way that they will always think. Um, I uh, agree with Gary that we, sh we we do we should point out, and this is a re relative to something B said too, that there is violence inherent in the continuation of the system. The system is a violent system. It does oppress and exploit people. It does meet violence on people, both here and internationally. So continuation of the system is a continuation of violence already. And what we are what we are advocating is a fundamental shift away from violence to the degree that the system uh, uh, doesn't, you know, doesn't uh, rather escalate the violence, but just the continuation of the system is violence. I do want to say that I, I think just as we see democracy, that there's a myth about democracy in this country, a myth that we have the best, most thoroughgoing democracy of anywhere in the world, and it's the best in the world, and America's number one, and we're more democratic than everybody else. And a significant part of that is bullshit. It's a myth. It's not true. Our democracy such that we have is very limited, restricted, and there are efforts to attack even that that limited democracy that, that we have, which is at best limited to parts of the political sphere. It's, it does not extend to where people live a lot of their lives <laughs> in uh, the jobs that they go to. There is no democracy on the job except to the extent that unions have organized to win it. But that myth is a double-edged sword. That's part of what happened with that giant shift of public opinion 
in Watergate. People are convinced that we have it, and when they see that we don't, they can get very angry very fast and very determined to fight that we should live up to what the promise is. So I think we, it's, we're not opposed to the democracy. We want more of it. We want it to be um, thoroughgoing, to be part of our economy as well as part of our political system. We want to extend the democracy, expand it, have more democratic input and more democratic and direct democratic decision making. Uh, and in that way, we are identifying ourselves with the best in American history, not just the ter many terrible things in U.S. history, but the best in American history, that fight to extend and protect democracy. Um, in response to Timothy about his, his uh, visit to Russia, I, I had a, a visit there too in 1990, before the dissolution of the Soviet Union, I was uh, had a three-week trip there and uh, had a chance to talk to some people. And many people, including communists that I talked to, were um, what they wanted and the way they put it sometimes was they wanted the best of both systems. They wanted socialism, they wanted the protections of socialism, they wanted the benefits of socialism, and they wanted the con consumer choice and um, uh, various other kinds of what they saw as freedoms. And they weren't wrong or bad to want that. They were just wrong or bad in the sense that they thought that was the choice before them. The choice before them was to improve and protect socialism or to have gangster capitalism. And what they ended up with, with was gangster capitalism. But they weren't wrong to want more consumer choice. They weren't wrong to want um, more individual liberties and freedom from restrictions, they were just wrong that they thought they had that option. What was actually being advocated was, uh, like I say, gangster capitalism. Uh, well, I've talked so long that I think I better uh, go on to my summary. I want to thank everybody for their participation, for their views, agreements, and disagreements, uh, and I do hope that this will be posted soon. Uh, so to summarize, the state is a mix of competing interests within which the ruling class dominates and in which the ruling class has written the rules and continues to write new rules. The state includes coercive institutions and laws. It also can include partial aspects of democratic participation. It can include public political space for protests, demonstrating, creating change. But the state also often includes limits on democratic participations as well. Just to mention one small one that we haven't yet, in the United States, what's called a secondary boycott is illegal. But that's a powerful tool in the hands of a people's movement to boycott whoever is selling something, even if they weren't engaged in making it. So that's one way in which a, a possible method of democratic resistance is made illegal by the state. So we need to see the state in a dialectical way. Where are the contradictions? Where is the motive force for change? What is the balance of forces and how can we work to change that balance? As for example, helping to promote a campaign of mass unionization. Pursuing a peaceful path to transition is a strategy to win those who seek a better world to the side of fundamental transformation, to understand that reforms and evolutionary progress is good, but we also need a revolutionary transformation of society. The peaceful path emphasizes our humanistic goals, focuses on us on what unites us with the vast majority and as a path to building mass unity. However, it is not a guarantee of peace because most violence emanates from a dispossessed ruling class. A peaceful path challenges the, challenges the system to behave in a peaceful manner. I admit this is not a strong point because an argument to this effect won't have much impact, but it does place the blame for their violence directly on the capitalist class. 
A crucial factor in determining good strategy is understanding the balance of power, understanding that all efforts to build a better future involve working to change the existing balance of forces. And a correct estimate of the existing balance of forces is a prerequisite for a developed strategy that accurately matches time, place, and circumstance. And that what is most revolutionary is not automatically what sounds most radical. What is most revolutionary is matching our ideas, our proposals, our struggles, and our demands to the real needs of the present moment. Socialists have to be about reforms in the current moment, building the maximum political unity between the left and the center, expanding the electorate and empowering workers. We have to be about defending democracy, but we also have to be about, ultimately, the struggle for state power, because without state power, no working class victories will become permanent. So I want to thank you for your time and attention. I want to urge you to feel free to email me suggestions for improving it or to e e well, there's my timer um, uh, email me for I'm uh, glad to send you copies of this PowerPoint after I fix a couple of typos I have other available PowerPoint presentations that uh, from other classes I've given which I'm uh, ready to share but you have to tell me which ones you want uh, and I have a list there and there is my email uh, and there's all I want to end with a commercial message. Keep your eyes out for a new book from international publishers within a few months, Green Strategy by yours truly. So I want to thank Dee, thank all the people who participated in this, and thanks for being engaged and participating in the struggle. <laughs>